see you again. Thanks for joining us. Right. This is Arlen calling. <laughs> so it's great to see all my Thanks. friends. And um, yeah, um, it's, I'm looking forward to contributing to this, um, this, this um, forum. I think it'll be a great thing to see. I, I know I'm going to learn a lot from you guys and hopefully I can share the things I've learned over the last 50 years or so. Thank you. Thanks, Eddie. Next, I want to welcome back another longtime friend and great Kenpo leader from Texas, Mr. Brian Duffy. Mr. Duffy, welcome. It's good to see you again, sir. It's great to be here. Thank you very much for including me. This is a, a great thing that you and Mr. White have put together, and I'm very happy to be involved with it. Great. And Mr. Michael Miller, you're up next. I want to welcome Mr. Miller, longtime Kenpo teacher and author from Pennsylvania. Michael, thanks for taking the time today. Thank you. I appreciate it. It's great to be back. All right. Next up from Miami, Florida, another great Kenpo leader, Mr. Manny Reyes. Uh, Mr. Reyes, if you would come off mute and say hello to everyone for us. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes, we can, sir. Thank you very much again for inviting uh, me uh, to this great uh, meeting where we're all going to share some of the stuff that we do. And I'd like to thank you and Mr. White for inviting me and nice to see everybody again. Thank you. You're very welcome, sir. And next up, a man who really needs no introduction in the Kenpo community. He is a, a great leader, teacher, practitioner, and one of the most respected men in Kenpo, and that's Mr. John Sepulveda. Mr. Sepulveda, thank you for joining us, sir. Well, thank you for having me back. This is always a great forum for not only those listening in to learn, but I think uh, as well as the rest, the rest of us will learn several things from me. So thanks for having me back. Anytime, sir. I would mention that normally we have Mr. Lee Wedlake on the panel. Mr. Wedlake had a schedule conflict, so he could not join us today, but I did meet with him and record his session. So we will edit that into the final, uh, final version. Next up, we have from Southern California, my instructor and uh, my instructor's wife, my longtime, oh, I would say my training partner, but I've given up trying to keep up with Barbara for the last 20 years. But Mr. and Mrs. Bob White, welcome, and uh, thanks for organizing this, boss. Oh, it's our pleasure. Barbara? But, um, Michelle, thank you again for this opportunity that um, you've given us to to share our experiences and um, be in service to the community. Thank you. Of course, my pleasure. And finally, we have a new panelist, a special guest joining us today, and that's Dr. Carl Totten. Uh, Dr. Totten has studied the Chinese healing, spiritual, and martial arts for over 50 years. He teaches classes in all the traditional Chinese internal and external martial arts. He's taught at five colleges and universities, including two schools of traditional oriental medicine, He's listed in the U.S. Martial Arts Hall of Fame in over 20 volumes of Who's Who biographies. Uh, Professor Totten has taught many of the most prominent members of the film, music, and entertainment industries, including A-list celebrities, executives, and athletes. In addition, he is a licensed clinical and educational psychologist and is the founder of the Taoist Institute. If you'd like to learn more about Dr. Totten, you can look him up at taoistinstitute.com. But Dr. Totten, it's great to have you here. We're certainly looking forward to hearing your input. Thank you for joining us, sir. Thank you, Vishal, and uh, thank you, Mr. White, Barbara. Really appreciate being here. And um, like someone mentioned, uh, this, of course, is coming week is the 30th uh, anniversary of Mr. Parker's death. And um, I look forward to participating in that event as well. So glad to be here. Thank you, sir. Great. Well, that tells you the experience and education of our panel. Today's topic is all around leadership, and I want to just take a second to explain how we got here. Our first state of the art, we talked about the state of the art, and the role of the teacher came up a lot. Then we had a discussion about teaching, and a lot of the discussion turned about how teachers need to be leaders. So we decided to have this panel discussion about organizational leadership. This is a topic I think that's very relevant and very interesting. To give a little background, uh, not to brag, but I recently completed a master's in organizational leadership. And as I was going through the classwork, it struck me how many of the different topics and discussion points not only applied to organizations such as companies or militaries or government, but how applicable they are to the Kenpo community and to martial arts in general. So I'd, I'd like to start by going through our panel here. And I'm going to unmute Mr. Downey. Or Eddie, you may need to unmute yourself again. And the first discussion point 
is for Mr. Downey. Mr. Downey, you lead a large organization throughout Europe, and you have some unique challenges around trying to lead an organization that crosses different cultural and language barriers, as well as just leading an organization in general. So I'm wondering what your thoughts are, Eddie. Is it possible, or is it even necessary, to unite Kenpo under a single leader such as Mr. Parker? What are your thoughts on that, Eddie? Well, if we have Mr. Parker, yes. But I don't think it's possible. I think Ed Parker was a unique person. He had so many qualities. Besides being an exceptional martial artist, he was a communicator, an entertainer, um, he motivational. I mean, he had... He had a lot of qualities. Now, maybe on his business side, he may have not been as successful, but he had so many great qualities. The reflection is, look at the people that he inspired. And the people are here this evening and the people all around the world that he inspired. So he inspired me and so many others. But I don't think there will be that thing for the future. But I think what, what the way it happened for me was, it was organic. I opened my school. I had been in associations and like a lot of people were dissatisfied, so just ran a good school. And then one of my students wanted to open another school, another school, another school. So we ended up with 40 schools and, you know, 20 countries. So it wasn't intended to be that. But I think a good teacher then produces good black belts and then, you know, it evolves. And I think it's, there is so many things that you need. Um, there's no doubt you have to have charisma. Um, there's no doubt that you have to have the knowledge. Um, I think if you if you have a person who wants to kind of be your leader or be your sensei, well, I don't think that's the person any of us want. But I think it's probably important to, within your own group or association, to see the potential leaders and mentor them and, and guide them. because And then also to recognize another group. So what I've always tried to do is I run an annual camp and I... The people that I respect, so my teacher is Master Sepulveda, and my great friend is Master Bob White, and they're my two people that I bring to Ireland every year to influence. And I bring, I, Siegel and the Bounty was a great friend. He came for many, many years. Obviously, Mr. Parker came. And I think it's, and that's how you, you selectively you go out to your community, you look for people that you know will be an influence on your students and your school that the parents can look forward to, they have moral character, they, have, they, have, they are going to do all the right things and improve not just the martial arts skills, but the, the qualities and the, the integrity of your students. And when you have all that, when you get a group, maybe it may not be one person. So Mr. Sepulveda might bring something, he's always a very special person for us, and then Mr. White brings another quality, Mr. Bounty brought a different quality. And that's how I built my group, because I realized that I was a good teacher, but I wanted my students to be exposed to the best I could find. And, you know, there are predatory instructors, there are people who want to teach and help you do something, but you really have to have a culture. And if you have a school culture and you know what, where you want to be and what you want to create, but you should link out to the people out there who you can see, maybe a lot of people have good legacy, they have good students, and probably a good indication in all martial arts is look at the students, look out and say, look at the people they produce, look at the qualities and look at the decisions. And, you know, Mr. Parker famously said, time either promotes or exposes. I know Mr. White says it a lot and it's true. You know, the, the emerging leaders of the Kempo community are already there. Some, of, some people are already where we are, but the new leaders are coming through. And it's very important I, to maybe to connect the network and maybe I, in camps, I try to give young instructors an opportunity to teach and expose them to being in front of people and also pass on the responsibility because it goes beyond Kempo. It, as um, Mr. Wedlake sometimes said, we don't, teach, we don't teach karate, we teach people. So I, I think um, we won't have another Ed Parker, but Ed Parker is in all of us. And it's really how we bring out what he gave us to our own personalities. So that's what I would think. I do owe an apology to Mr. Ted Sumner. When I was going through the list of people on our panel, I accidentally skipped him. So Ted, please forgive me. Um, if you could come off mute, I just want to welcome you and thank you for your time. Uh, your insight is always greatly appreciated. Um, 
Okay, are you going to unmute me? Yeah, I just unmuted you. You're, you're good. So sorry about that, sir. Thank you. It's an honor to be here. An honor to be included in this, and uh, this is pretty, uh, pretty up there company to be in, and I'm. Uh, it's a pleasure to to be part of it. Great. Thank you, sir. Sorry about that. Next, Mr. Casey. The next question is for you. I'm going to take you off mute, Paul. So the next question, Mr. Casey, is. We, we, Mr. Downey talked about leaders, and the question is, many can lead, but that doesn't make them a leader. There's a difference between someone who leads and someone who's a leader. In your opinion, how do you define a true leader in the Kenpo community? So, Mr. Casey, that question's for you. He's somebody who makes everybody feel like somebody. Simply saying, in all the time I spent in Pasadena, and the teachings I've read of Ed Parker, from the interviews and the conversations I've had with many of our distinguished guests here. Listen to them. See what the vision that they have and make it happen. Be bold. Um, inspire. And finally, it will result in a positive res res uh, result. And that's a really important because, you know, Mr. Downey said, we don't teach karate, we teach people. These people come in there looking for you. They find you and they look for guidance. That takes a special individual. That takes a person that believes in themselves, to have confidence, to believe that they can do these things. I experienced that in 1978 when I met Frank Trejo. He taught me the lesson of the fight in my mind and the fight in the, the ring. That same day, I met Ed Parker for the first time, who walked over to me and introduced himself to me, and I was just a green belt. And I'm thinking, why is he talking to me? Both of these guys had a very important influence in my life, and I'm grateful, and that is what I think a leader should be. So I base it on the people that I admired because they demonstrated through their actions to help me to be better. And that's why the Campbell Karate Hall of Fame exists, so we can showcase these leaders. That's a great insight and great answer. Thank you, Mr. Casey. Okay, I want to welcome back one of our guests who's been with us from the very beginning of the State of the Arts, and he is truly recognized as one of the real leaders in Kenpo. Coming to us from Texas, welcome back, Mr. Lee Wedlake. Sir, it's good to see you. Good to see you, Vishal, and uh, good to be back with everybody else on the panel here. It's always an honor and a pleasure. So our next question goes to Mr. Wedlake, and that is, what are the qualities that is needed to be a good leader in the Kenpo community? What are your thoughts on that, sir? Well, when I read the question, I, uh, my first impression was to say we could strike out um, in Kenpo because leadership is across the board. Um, but there are things that, of course, you do need to have to be a good leader uh, in a martial arts system. And uh, I've... Um, come up through the system since the uh, 70s, and I've seen a variety of leaders, uh, people that have risen to the top. And I remember a funny comment that one of my uh, teachers a long time made ago, we were talking about how the uh, cream rises to the top, and he says, well, slag does too. So, <laughs> um, you know, we like to think it's the, it's the cream of the crop that become the leaders. There are natural leaders, and leadership, I think, is something that can be taught. It can be cultivated. Um, I went through several leadership courses over time. I went through the squadron officer school through the U.S. Air Force. And my group just had a uh, session very much like this on leadership uh, not too long ago. And fortunately, one of our black belts was an instructor at the uh, Air Force squadron officer school. So uh, they talk uh, quite a bit about leadership. They spend seven weeks on leadership in that program. And uh, I remember some significant items uh, from that instruction. And uh, one of the important ones is that you're a manager and you're a manager of many things. When you're doing Kempo, especially Kempo in the street, you become a manager of violence. But as a leader in the community, uh, the Kempo community, and this is a tough thing, uh, there are other qualities that you need to, to possess and you need to be able to deliver on. Um, it's a funny thing that I've talked with um, many who are leaders in the business community, 
And there's an opinion out there that Kempo people are the most difficult to work with. And they said it's like herding cats or nailing jello to a wall. <laughs> Sometimes we think that maybe it's because um, Kempo people are, are really critical thinkers and there's a whole lot of what if, what if, what if that goes on. And uh, it makes it hard with, um, with them trying to teach their subject because, you know, there's those out there in, in all walks that like to say, well, we've got a better way. But um, you do need to get a grip on certain principles, certain concepts that uh, will make a good leader. And one of the things that, uh, in my experience, was uh, I was a professional pilot for many years. And uh, I was an aviation safety counselor for the Federal Aviation Administration as well and a certified flight instructor. And we, uh, we have to be leaders when it comes to that sort of thing. But one of the concepts that we have within that is called CRM, and the uh, initials have taken two different meanings over time. At one point in time, it was cockpit resource management, and another time it was crew resource management. It was crew resource management first, which meant you had to work with your co-captain or your first officer. There was a difference in the two. And uh, because there was an autocratic thing that was going on in cockpits over years where the captain was the final word and the, the uh, joke was that uh, the first officer, first officer was there to pour my Cokes and laugh at my jokes. Well, when this comes down to it, you've got to be able to use the resources, use that brain you've got sitting over in the other seat. And then they changed it to cockpit resource management, which means not only that other person, or maybe a third person, because you've got a flight engineer or a navigator in a bigger aircraft, but you've also got the aircraft itself, which is feeding you information, and you've got people on the ground in the form of air traffic control. You need to integrate all of these. And then you take this sort of an idea and you translate this over to the karate world, the Kempo world in particular, and... Uh, it's a matter of saying, I've got people that have certain skills and I can't run all this on my own. So you need to draw on them. And this takes, um, often takes a fine hand because there's a lot of egos that are involved with all this. And that's where the management and the leadership uh, will come in. One of the first components of leadership that I learned was that you have to be a good follower. And I remember a quote from Winston Churchill, which he said, I like to learn, but I don't like to be taught. And so in a lot of karate schools, it's taught this, this, and this. Don't ask any questions. Just do what I say. The Parker system is quite different in that Mr. Parker wanted you to ask questions. We did the same thing in uh, aviation, where if we got a clearance, we were taught to challenge air traffic control. Because sometimes they make mistakes. And karate instructors make mistakes too. And sometimes the uh, thing about not asking questions is merely because the instructor really doesn't know the answers and doesn't want to get caught being shown that they don't know the answers. The correct answer is, I don't know, but I know where to find out. I need these resources. And that's one of the nice things about um, these town halls is that you see that um, senior instructors are talking to each other. So I've found in the past that people think that they don't talk to each other, that they don't like each other, they don't get along or what have you. Um, but they do draw on each other, and it is that form of uh, cockpit resource management that we use in aviation is because I'm taking things from Mr. White, he's taking things from me, we're learning something from John Sepulveda, we're talking with Ted Sumner over here, and we're taking uh, their viewpoints and their operative principles and employing them for ourselves, you know, because we like to say, I'm going to steal that. I'm going to take that and use it. And this is uh, one of the things that um, to carry this forward is it's a given that it's, you lead by example. And there are certain uh, aspects of that, that, uh, that come to light when you talk about that. Um, Bob White is great example of how someone who inspires as a leader. He's gone through some stuff with his health issues in the last several years that, and he's come through it because a lot of people said he's not going to make it. Not only did he make it, but he came out, I think he came out stronger on the other end and something that normally kills 96% of the people that had what he had. That's pretty inspirational. 
and he's not afraid to tell the story. So that's a, uh, a big quality in a leader. There is vision that is involved in this. If you read Tony Robbins and you read Brian Tracy and you read the military uh, leadership manuals, there's got to be a strategy. There's got to be a vision. What is your product? What is your what? What are you going to do with a person who comes in and wants to be a black belt one day, and then turn those people out through the training course? It takes quite some time, energy, effort, and so on. So you've got to have your lesson plans. You've got to be organized because you know, students will pick up on it right away. This person looks like they're just making it up on the fly. There's got to be a progression in there. There's got to be accountability. Um, one of the things I encountered way back when I, when I was in a different form of Kempo, I originally studied the Tracy system that went over to the Parker system. And when we started to convert the school, I got resistance. I got people uh, inside. I said, well, I don't know. This looks like it's going to be, you know, people don't like change. I said, you need to trust me. You've trusted me so far. You need to trust me with this. This is going to be better for you with what we want to do and where we want to go. And that is not only the vision, but it's also the accountability, which is I'm going to handle this. I'm going to make sure you get the, the best education that you can and that you uh, come out of this with what you want to come out of it, with the proficiency, with the knowledge, the abilities, and the satisfaction of earning your black belt uh, this way. A lot of this is going to take communication. So uh, leaders need to be able to communicate. and. Uh, you can communicate through writing, you can communicate through speech, you can communicate through your body language, through your everyday motions, and it's easy to forget that the little ones are watching you all the time. So I remember uh, I used to tell the kids, you know, you need to take care of yourself, you need to be safe, you need to wear your helmet when you ride a bicycle. And one day I rode up and I was on my motorcycle, and at the time we didn't have a helmet law back then, it was one of those few times I didn't wear a helmet, one of the kids came up and said, but Mr. Wedlake, you're not wearing a helmet. <laughs> I said, well, I'm the hypocrite and I wore a helmet every single time after that. Um, so it's important because of these lessons that you give not only to children, but of course to adults. Because a lot of times adults are just like children and everybody wants to know the secret handshake. And there's a reason that like Chinese systems, for example, are built like a family. You have a teacher father and a teacher mother, and then you have uncles and you have senior brothers and, and all that. And we have elements of that in our system with uh, Sibung and Sibok and, and so on. So um, it's a valuable concept that we use because of the way that we want to nurture people and bring them up in the system. Um, ideally, you've got uh, a leader who has an element of humility. Uh, sometimes not having some humility, having a big ego pays off. I mean, somebody like George Patton comes to mind or Douglas MacArthur. Very successful, but on the other hand, you've got your uh, Admiral Nimitzes and people like that that don't do that sort of thing. So a different approach works different ways. It's, there's not just one way to do this. Um, there's got to be cooperation between yourself and your, your assistants, and there's gotta be a cooperation with, with uh, you and the students. And that's where empathy comes in. And it's uh, leaders and teachers in particular have to know that not everybody learns the same way. And I say, this guy's got an issue, or this lady's got an issue. How do we work with that? Um, so we need to keep educating ourselves, and we need our, uh, our students to know that we're educating ourselves. So people have said to me over time, said, we see that you go off and you've, you've done this and you've done that and, you, and you're able to tie these other fields into what you do in the Kempo. And I like to think that that is a pretty big uh, component to being a leader as well. Uh, decisiveness comes into it. Um, leaders will also will take their advisors, get their advice, formulate plans, and then they will have the confidence to go forward and do this thing. I mean, even when there is some doubt, they don't show it. I mean, Eisenhower at D-Day comes to mind with that whole story. He just wasn't sure this was going to work. So he'd had his disasters in the past, but great leaders learn on these uh, from these things and they build on it and they get better and better over time. 
So I like to think that uh, with a tempo person, you've got to have the knowledge, the proficiency, a track record. A track record could be from tournament wins. It can be from producing black belts. It can be from producing black belts who have tournament wins and, and a, a whole list of things. Um, but it's also that they have this focus, they have this vision, they know where they want to go, they know where they want to take their people, they know where, where they want to take the system. And uh, you can see where those leaders come, come to the top and they're successful at it. So um, I think that the, the final thing would be having some integrity to go along with this. And uh, I, I think that's what you're seeing, particularly with the group that uh, Bob White has assembled around him. Um, you've got some instructors that have got very good reputations and you don't just get that from being a nice guy. Okay, there's an integrity that goes along with, there's a sense of ownership of what they're doing. Uh, and then you can see the proof in, in how their students do and so on. Whether it's uh, running schools, it's out on the tournament circuit or just plain being good human beings out there and they're helping and they're giving back to their communities. So it's a whole big subject, of course, which is gonna fill up the, uh, the entire uh, discussion here today. But um, that's my thumbnail on uh, qualities of leadership. Well, that's great insight, sir. And it certainly leads to the next set of questions for this esteemed group we've had. I wanna thank you for taking the time. And so next I wanna to go to Mr. Manny Reyes. So Mr. Reyes, if you could take your phone off mute. The question from Mr. Reyes is, if communication and the ability to spread your message is a key factor in being a successful leader, how can someone or can someone who's shy and not naturally a strong communicator be a leader? What are your thoughts on that, sir? Well, uh, me, myself, I uh, basically uh, started, you know, my school in 1972. And uh, actually, I really never thought I was going to get to the point where I am now. Uh, I wasn't really a person that would like, you know, wanted to have uh, this uh, many schools and this group of people that I'm teaching now, but it just all became like a passion of mine. Because uh, I was pretty shy, believe it or not, at the beginning. Not now, but I used to be pretty shy. And uh, basically, what happened was that in Mr. You know, when Mr. Parker passed away in 1990, he left a vacuum with the people that actually speak Spanish in other Latin American countries. And that's when I started actually, you know, opening up myself a little more you know, to teach, uh, uh, just like, like uh, Mr. Danny said that, you know, he first thing was just to open his school and, you know, like myself also, a lot of my students started opening schools and then the opportunity came for me to teach other people from, you know, Latin America uh, in South America that were looking for somebody that can translate the system in the language that they, they could understand. You know, thank God for that, I got about 10, different countries now that I teach, uh, that I'm teaching, that I have students there. And we have about 20 schools here in the U.S. affiliated also. Since 1993, when I opened, started my own organization. Um, so basically, I think the, the main thing is as you start working with people, you realize that, you, you know, if you have the knowledge and the passion and you're willing to share the knowledge and have other people also, you know, learn what you learn. And also, not only that, I also, do, since I do a Pan American tournament every year, which is like a huge uh, NASCAR event, I also do a, usually do like put it together with a Kempo tournament, and I also do a seminar. And I have also brought people like Larry Tatum, Gilbert Belez, Mr. White came, Mr. Lee Welley, they have come down to teach in my seminars. So I would, you know, they could, my students can also see some of the other great instructors that we have so they can, have, you know, get more knowledge. Uh, in a different way of doing, do, doing things, that how so they can grow. So, because my passion is that when I'm not here anymore, that my students can follow up the tradition that I taught them and that I learned from Mr. Parker, which is something that I would like everybody to, you know, to keep after I'm gone. But uh, being shy, it was like at the beginning for me, like I said, I didn't think I ever was gonna get to the point where I now that I have, you know, all these uh, people following me, you know, so I thank Mr. Parker for 
teaching me and, you know, God for letting me be the source for them to be able to grow more in the art. You know, thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Reyes, especially bringing your own personal experiences into that. I think it makes the answer much, much more real. Before we go to the next question, I would like to remind our audience members that we will open it up for question and answer at the end of, uh, at the, end of the questions to our panelists. So if you're interested in asking a question or, or making a comment, please send me a message or send everyone a message through the chat. I'll unmute you and call on you or you can unmute yourself, but we want to do it in some sort of order. So send me a message first. Okay, Mr. Miller, why don't you come off mute, Michael? And the next question is for you. We talked a lot about the different qualities that a leader possesses, and Mr. Wedlake certainly um, gave us some insight on that. But leaders are humans, and all humans have our pluses and minuses and our flaws. Uh, Michael, in your opinion, what's the worst fault, the worst quality a leader can have? What are your thoughts on that, Michael? Okay. Um, there's obviously, there's several great qualities a leader can have, and there's several poor qualities a, a leader can have. I'm not so sure you can kind of pinpoint one single quality as being the worst. However, for me, um, I look at it at two A's basically, uh, which is um, a lack of accountability and a lack of adaptability in my opinion. Um, let's talk about adaptability first. Basically, I don't believe there's a one size fits all or my way or the highway approach when it comes to leadership. Um, I feel good, strong leaders are able to adapt to any situation, just as we have to adapt to our environment um, in a real situation, like a street situation. If I have to defend myself or if I sense uh, some type of trouble, I have to learn how to adapt to the environment. So I feel um, a good, strong leader should be able to adapt to any situation. So as far as what's a poor quality, well, a lack of adaptability is one of them i mean think about it there, there's uh there's no one way to paint there's no one way to write there's no one way to cook there's no one way to sing there's no one way to play an instrument and so on and so forth and if i use uh, sports as an example look at baseball you got the pitcher and the catcher who have to work together as leaders to decide which pitch is the proper pitch at the proper moment you don't just throw the same pitch every time. Um, and, and, uh, and then if you look at football, uh, if something's not going right, something, or you're struggling with something, you have to call an audible. You have to be able to make certain changes in the moment. So adaptability to me is something that's extremely important for a leader. So if you have poor adaptability, that's not good. The second one that I mentioned, which I think is very, very, you know, as, just as important, I should say, is accountability okay uh, i think that a poor leader will not hold themselves accountable instead they will place blame um, and then when something goes right a poor leader will take all the credit um, so what we want is to be a good leader you you give people due credit when credit is due and you take accountability when something goes wrong especially if you're the one who screwed up you you hone up you hone up to it and 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 you say hey you know i uh it, it, you know this was all on me and i need to do a better job so i say i uh, as far as uh, the, the two worst things for me i know there's a bunch of them uh definitely a bunch of them you know you can talk about integrity you can talk about poor communication skills and blah 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 but uh my thing is you have to be adaptable period um and you have to be accountable that's great. I like using the uh, the double A's there. That makes it much mm -hmm. more memorable. Thank you, Michael. Mr. Duffy, next question comes to you. We've talked a lot about the qualities of a leader. Uh, there's a theory of leadership called the great man theory, or I guess we should rename it to the great person theory, which proposes that leaders are born with certain qualities such as charisma, um, natural skill sets, public speaking, whatever qualities you want to think about. Do you believe leaders are born with those qualities or can leaders be made? Can, can those qualities be taught? What are your thoughts on that, Mr. Duffy? Well, this was a, a very interesting question uh, for me and, and not having gone through a, uh, 
a master's in leadership like yourself, I had to do a little research on this. Uh, and you know, I found that the, the great man theory uh, came about in the 19th century. And, and as you say, it, it says leaders are born, not made, and they deserve to lead as a result of their you know, natural abilities and talents. But there was also an opposing view back in the 19th century as well, and that leaders were the product more of their environment. Um, but the, the great man theory was still the dominant theory back in the, in the 19th century. But with the advent of the study of behavioral sciences in the mid 20th century, uh, it led to a view that leadership is more of a science that can be learned and nurtured. So that led me to look at, okay, what are the traits of a great leader? So I, there's a, a trait model of leadership as well. And it's a study of the characteristics of uh, leaders, both successful and unsuccessful, to predict whether someone would be successful. And successful leaders definitely have uh, interest abilities and personality traits that are different from those of less effective leaders. So the objective then became to identify, you know, the core traits of effective leaders. And to do this, I started looking at different uh, uh, articles on leadership and the traits of a good leader. And, uh, well, you know, what I was hoping to find was like a, a, a core of six to 10 traits that, that repeated over and over again uh, that people wrote about leadership qualities and they would agree upon. But, you know, while there were some traits that were repeated, with every new article that I, I went over, there was a list of different traits as well and, and more traits and more traits until just a few articles that I listed had 30 different traits of what an effective leader could be. And this is actually, you know, the, one of the limitations in the trait theory of leadership is the fact that, that uh, there's been over 100 different traits defined and they're all real generalities. Uh, but the conclusion of the trait leadership article really uh, was very interesting as well and, and kind of uh, hit, the, hit this question that you were talking about. The conclusion, I'm gonna read it here, says the trait approach gives rise to the question whether leaders are born or made and whether leadership is an art or a science. However, these are not mutually exclusive alternatives. Leadership may be something of an art. It still requires the application of special skills and techniques. Even if there are certain inborn qualities to make a good leader, these natural talents need encouragement and development. A person is not born with self-confidence. Self-confidence is developed. Honesty and integrity are a matter of choice. Motivation to lead comes from the individual and the knowledge of, they were talking about business, but in our case, our art, can be acquired. You know, while cognitive ability has its origins partly in genes, it still needs to be developed, and none of these ingredients come overnight. So that kind of, you know, says that, that there's more or less both there. So how does that apply to us as martial arts teachers? You know, so we've all had individuals who come to us who are natural leaders. They're the alpha male or female. Uh, you know, they stand out in the, in the crowd. But we've also had students that come to us with none of those qualities. You know, we've, we've got the, we've had stories, I'm sure everybody who has a school has a story of the child or the, even the adult who comes with, you know, no self-confidence and very little physical ability. And through the process of training, you know, they develop self-confidence, physical fitness, coordination, self-discipline, respect, compassion, integrity, goal setting. And these are characteristics of leadership. You know, leadership is actually, you know, part and parcel of what we do as martial arts instructors. You know, when you have an advanced student work with a lower belt, that's developing leadership. When you turn one of your you know, students into an assistant instructor, that's developing leadership. When you develop a staff that can take care of your school and run it while you're gone, that's developing leadership. You know, some of those people that you put in those positions might have already been those alpha males or females, you know, those natural born leaders, but many of them could be the ones that have developed these qualities through the process of the training that you have afforded them. So I would agree with the conclusion of the article that while some people have natural abilities and stand out that you know there are others many more others that those abilities are developed 
through the training process. And these abilities and talents may come naturally, but you know, both groups need encouragement and development to become effective leaders. You know, one of the, one of the traits that uh, I looked at in, in studying this or I saw was lead by example. And that was something Mr. Miller attested to and, and Mr. Downey, everyone who's talked has, all, has talked about that, lead by example. That's something that we all try to do. And I'm gonna leave here with a quote uh, that I got from uh, Seabot Kelly. Uh, and this was a motto that he got from uh, a, a Christian scouting group that he belonged to, that he was part of a mentor for called the Royal Rangers. And it says, you cannot teach what you do not know. You cannot lead where you will not go. What you do not have, you cannot give. And you can't share a life that you will not live. So leading by example is a thing that, that most of us do, or most of us aspire to. Hopefully the example that we give to our students is a good one. Uh, and I believe that the process of the training develops leadership. Mr. Duffy, thank you. I didn't mean to make you do all that research. I think you probably went to some of the same articles I did when I wrote a bunch of papers, but great insight. And thank you well, for it was taking very educational, and I actually enjoyed it quite a bit. All right. Well, I'll, uh, I'll send you my textbook if you want to do some more reading over the, the weekend. <laughs> thank you. All right. So let's mute you. Next up is Dr. Totten. I'm going to take you off mute, sir. Or Dr. Totten, uh, maybe you could take yourself off mute. There we go. Okay, just did. So, next question is for you, sir. And, and Mr. Duffy talked about leading by example and the different ways someone can lead. I'm interested to get your insight on this. Can a person be considered a leader or lead in the martial arts if they're not actively training or teaching? Can someone who contributes by other means, such as books and videos and, and other types of, of contributions, be an effective leader? What are your thoughts on that, Dr. Totten? Uh, well, I certainly agree that uh, a good leader is someone who leads by example, and of course that's going to require, in, in a physical art like uh, Kempo, is going to re require uh, training, uh, a great deal of training, because in order to be an effective role model, we have to be able to be exemplars, we have to be able to exhibit the qualities that we're trying to develop in students, because otherwise there's a disconnect, and it comes off as inauthentic, you know, if we're talking about being you know, physically fit and having, you know, these uh, great qualities that we're trying to inspire others and we aren't exhibiting them ourselves. And it, it looks like we're kind of a phony and I don't think people appreciate that in life. So I think that is, that is important. But on the other hand, uh, it's also another way to exhibit our skills and knowledge sets these days, and for a long time, of course, has been books, manuscripts, and of course, these days, the medium we're on now, right? The, the internet and video, video instruction. You know, for, uh, this year particularly, if we did not have uh, uh, Zoom and platforms like this, many of us would have been out of business a long time ago. You know, my particular school has been, as many of yours, has been closed since March. And so all of my instruction has been over uh, video and Zoom. You know, I have books available for my students. I have a, a huge Vimeo library of several hundred uh, videos for them to reference. Um, it's a way, it's almost like an extension. It's a way to extend the teaching to the world. Uh, just think if we did not have Mr. Parker's books, where we'd be. You know, the Infinite Insight series, uh, Secrets of Chinese Karate, and all the other things that Mr. Parker wrote. I began training in uh, martial arts through the medium of books before I ever even had a teacher. And that was one of the things that inspired me to actually start learning because I, I would get these books and I would be so in, inspired by what I saw, I've, I knew I had to go out and find a teacher and begin training. Uh, books and videos these days are also another way to maintain standards in the art. You know, if, you know, for example, the Infinite Insight series, you know, Mr. Parker laid a roadmap for people to follow for generations. And we're following that to this day in terms of what is included 
properly in the art of Kenpo and his incredible ability to use analogies and his, and his communicative ability allows us to communicate with people from multiple backgrounds using common language that people can assimilate and associate to. So I think that it's a, it's a great way to transmit uh, knowledge uh, around the world, you know, from leaders, you know, who have developed the art to a high level. It's a way to maintain standards. It's a way to document the art, you know, what an art properly is supposed to look like. You know, when, when I want to see how Kempo is supposed to, the flavor, the energy that Kempo is supposed to exhibit, you know, I'll go look at Mr. Parker or some of the other uh, leaders, some of whom are on the uh, screen here today, and I'll look at how, he, how, how these people move, and, I'll, and it inspires me to continue working at the art so that uh, my level continues to improve uh, over time. So I think that books and videos, particularly these days, are absolutely essential and are an excellent way for a leader to communicate with the world. Thank you, sir. Your input is, is greatly appreciated and uh, very well spoken. Reminder for those uh, audience members, if you do wish to ask some questions of our panelists, please send me or the group a chat. Let us know who you'd like to speak to, and then I'll call on you and you can unmute and come on. So, Dr. Tom, I'm gonna mute you. Next question goes from Mr. Sepulveda, and sir, if you could unmute yourself, there you go. Uh, Mr. Sepulveda, hopefully your internet is staying up and stable. So, we've talked a lot about the qualities of a leader, and as Mr. Miller said, there's many different ways to do things. So there's a lot of different styles of leadership. I think we've all seen them either in person or through, through studies and books and TV and movies, et cetera. Some of those different styles include servant leadership, transformational leadership, authoritative leader, et cetera. Do you believe any one particular style is best suited for the martial arts or what style have you seen that's most effective in the martial arts? So Mr. Sepulveda, as the leader of a large organization, what are your thoughts on that? Well, in the early years, I have to say that um, for many of us, I'm sure, it was more authoritative type of leadership because that's the way we were brought up and you were, you know, you, you showed up ready to work and you did work and you were told what to do and when to do it and you performed if you wanted to stay. I think as things have progressed and things that I have learned, uh, I like more of a transformational type of leadership, although some of the others probably could be included as well to have some integrity or to keep the integrity like many people have already spoke about, you know. A lot of it is leading by example, like everybody has mentioned. Uh, I like what Mr. M uh, Miller also said, you have to have adaptability. You've gotta be able to work with the group that you have. Uh, I like the transformational because it gets a group of your, your peers and or within your school and you share ideas. You know, how are we gonna make this better for all, all of us? One of the things when I started my group, it was, you know, this isn't John Sepulveda's group, this is our group. How are we gonna make it better for ourselves? How are we gonna contribute? Uh, we have some of our, our guys that have gone out and studied the grappling or you know, the ground you know, um, game. And one of my things was, you know, yeah, you don't need permission. The one thing I do ask though is bring the information back. Uh, I know Mr. Beltramo is watching great, great, you know, kickboxer, great coach in that. He's got some great students with that. And he shares all of that with us. He continues to come out and, and give that information. So I, I think, you know, taking that and inspiring others and trying to execute, you know, the change in tandem with a, a committed members of your group, I think is the way to go. You know, it's, it's proven well, you know, we don't, I don't always make the best decisions but at the end of the day, I listen to everybody. Everybody has an equal voice. Doesn't matter what rank you are. If you have something to share, I encourage it. And then just you know, try to make the right decision. And if it isn't, we just grow from it. You know, others have gotten upset you know, that I didn't make the right decision that they thought was right. And it might be one or two or three of them. And you know, if they decide to go, I get that. You know? But at the end of the day, one of the things I learned from Mr. Parker and some of the things I, you know, some of the decisions I watched him make, you know, and I asked him about them later and he always had a good answer. 
he said, you know, it isn't about me. It's about the group as a whole and what's going to be good for the best of us. So I, I try to follow that leadership and do the best I can. And hopefully, you know, it, it works, you know, I think for the, for the group as a whole. That's great, sir. And I, I think that's the important thing you brought up is that the leader should be concerned about what's best for the group. So thank you for, for sharing that. Next up, uh, Mrs. White, if you could, I'll see if I can unmute you. If not, you can come off mute yourself. Yeah, Barbara, if you could come off mute. Okay, so the next question is for Mrs. White. And as soon as they look like, yes, they're off mute. So Barb, we've talked a lot about the different qualities of a leader and the different styles of leadership. But I think one thing that's come through is that being a leader in itself is a job. It takes effort, it takes energy, and you kind of have to be on all the time. Yet leaders, they're people. We have our good days and our bad days. So how do a leader stay motivated? How do you maintain that, that presence to be a leader and to stay motivated? And you're certainly someone who's a leader, not only in our school, but in the Kenpo community. How do you, how do you stay motivated to be a leader? Vishal, I, I want to thank you, first of all, for the subject that you gave me, because it's, uh, it's something that I have experienced, and I think that we all experience periods of our time in our life when we're feeling in a funk or we're not as motivated as we'd like to be. And I don't think that these are necessarily, it, that it is necessarily a negative thing to experience that, because it affords us the opportunity to look at our life and find areas where maybe we we'd like to make some changes and, and um, have personal growth. So I think it can be used as a positive, and for me it certainly has. Um, you know, I'd like to share in the Women's Symposium, I shared that, I, that setbacks are a source of strength for later on in our life. And I, I believe the, set, the uh, feeling unmotivated, it could be seen as a setback, but it can also be seen as a source of strength and growth, personal life in our personal life. Um, I'd like to share um, how it's, how I've dealt with it and um, maybe some people can relate to that. Usually when I've come to a point where I'm feeling demotivated in a funk, it's generally because I'm out of balance in my life. And we have in karate, we want to always balance our aspects of training. The same thing in life, we need to balance life. and. For me personally, it's usually a, a dis disconnect between um, my, what I feel is my spiritual life and my personal life. And then from there, it kind of goes on a domino effect and may affect the way I sleep, the way I uh, exercise, relationships, and my stress level. What I've learned from this, change my my mental I need to change my behavior and once I change my behavior the culture of my mind improves and that could be something like spending more time in my Bible every day it could be going out to take a walk it could be slowing down in my life and spending time with my the love of my life my husband he says I work too much and I think sometimes he's right I need to slow down and uh, balance my life and from there my mind improves and I I live a better life so I, I I like the fact that I got this subject because this is something that I do experience and I realize I do need to balance my life so I, I wrote a little blueprint that I'd like to share that I think helps to maintain a balanced life and maybe decreases the chances of us having these periods of being in a funk and demotivation is the first thing is that acceptance is the answer to all life's problems. When we get to this point where we are feeling demotivated and in a funk, accept the fact that it's happening and what can we do to learn from this and improve ourselves. Give thanks daily. I mean, thank God we're able to wake up in the morning and live this life that God has given us in this beautiful world. And I know that uh, with COVID going on and everything, maybe, maybe the world doesn't look so beautiful, but, but it is, and it's an opportunity for us to live a great day. I like what John Wooden said in his uh, seven point creed, make each day a masterpiece. 
it's been given to you, it's a gift. What can we do today to make each day our own masterpiece? Uh, there's so much going on in the news. I try to stay away from the news. I like to keep current if possible. Maybe I'm not as current as I, I could be, but immerse yourself in positive things. Read the Bible, read something positive, do something positive so that you, you create a, a feeling of goodness around yourself. Help someone daily. Do one thing to help somebody. Uh, share your passion. Go back to think about what it was that really brought you. For me, what was it that brought me to martial arts that I absolutely loved about it, that I couldn't get enough about it, of it, and share it with somebody else. That enthusiasm, my husband likes to say enthusiasm is contagious. Well, it springs right back at you. You share your passion, it comes right back to you. And you remember what it was, your first love that brought you there. And I'd like to then share a thought for the day. Receiving affirmation from somebody else that you hold in high esteem is one of the best ways to stay motivated. So I say pass it on. Try, do your best to motivate others and you'll have rewards in life. And you, I, I believe that we will maintain more motivation in our own life. That's it. Thanks, Michelle. Thanks, Barb. And I think I speak on behalf of everyone who knows you when I say I have to laugh when you say slow down because your idea of slowing down is doing 500 squats instead of 1,000 every day. All right. Next question is to Mr. White. That's a tough act to follow, boss. But yeah, no. A leader can only be effective if they have followers, right? By definition, a leader has to have followers. What do you believe is the role of the follower? And in specific, how does that correlate to the instructor-student relationship in the martial arts? Well, personally, um, I wouldn't want them to think of themselves as followers. I would want them to think of being part of a team and a necessary part of the team. We know in the Bible, it talks about how the church is made up of many different parts. And we want the same thing at our studio. We want the people that are good at forms or the people that are great fighters or the people that write books or great teachers or you know, whatever uh, their part and contributions are to the school, I want them to know they're of equal importance to everybody else. For years, we were dominant on the heroes. We had a lot of great tournament champions, and they were like the in crowd. They were the ones that got a lot of the attention. But it really isn't what our school's about. Our school is about um, being a part of, and that's what I, the atmosphere that I would really want in order for us to grow. And, the reason that uh, I have so much respect for so many people on the panel today is because they, they live this. You see it. First time we ever went to Ireland, Barbara and I were so impressed with the way Eddie taught and worked with his students and the respect that he showed to them and the respect that they gave back. And John Sepulveda is like that. You know, we're real close because of many reasons, but one of them is just the way that they conduct themselves and their organization is so consistently solid where everybody has integrity and they have characters. You know, a lot of times you'll see people that they're loyal to you, their loyalty to you will end when their need for you ends. And, you know, that's a terrible, terrible atmosphere and it ends up destroying organizations. So what I would want from our students is that realization that they are important that they're contributors, not just consumers, they're contributors. And I want their input and I want them to know that what they say is important to us. You know, respect at a studio is earned. You can't demand it. And what I would want is our guys to know that, that when you work hard, you, nobody goes home and brags about somebody who loafs. You know, they might talk negatively about them, but people are lifted up by the attitude that they bring to the floor and what they would work. So what I would want from our entire school is the realization that they're of equal importance, that when they work hard, they get self-respect, of course, but they get the respect of their peers. Um, and that type of atmosphere, it does become contagious. It does, um, it creates 
an atmosphere where people know there's a reward for effort. You know, real quick, I know in the Israeli army, people that are, they get a chance to become officers are voted in by their peers, people they train with, people they fight with, people they eat with, sleep with, all of that. It's all part of the people that are, that make up their army and they're put in positions of leadership because of the position that they've earned with each other. And, and that's how I want our school. Uh, respect, it can't be appointed. It's gotta be something that uh, people know you deserve. So that would be my answer, Michelle. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. White. And I think your school certainly, our school certainly has that atmosphere that makes it such a great place to train and the reason it's been around for, for so many years. Okay, we have one last question, and that's from Mr. Sumner. And before I do that, again, reminder to people in the audience, if you'd like to ask a question to any of our panelists, we will open it up. So at, that, at this point, if you do want to ask a question, please uh, send a message through the chat so we can start queuing things up. And I'm going to mute Mr. White. And Mr. Sumner, if you could come off mute. Probably easiest if you do it yourself, sir. No, oh, I got you, Ted. You got me? I got you. Okay, so yeah. let's... Last question is from Mr. Sumner, and then like I said, we'll open it up. We've talked a lot about communication and the influence that leaders have, and certainly these are unique times with COVID where we can't get together in person. So in what ways do you see that new technologies, not just Zoom or, or collaboration, but technology in general, will affect leadership and leaders? What are your thoughts on that, sir? Well, let me preface this by saying I'm not a, I'm not a real visionary and I'm not a futurist for sure, but um, I did, uh, my school was in the Silicon Valley. I grew up there. I taught a lot of these guys who were uh, the pioneers in, in, uh, in bringing about a lot of the technologies we have today. Um, but uh, the, the potential for technology and advances in technology is virtually limitless. I mean, it's only our imagination that, that gets in the way. But uh, in 1999, uh, Ray Kurzweil, uh, in his book, uh, The Age of Spiritual Machines, uh, postulated uh, the law of accelerating returns. And uh, according to that, the rate of change uh, in a wide variety of, of um, systems, including technologies, uh, tends to increase exponentially. Now, um, he, um, he also stated that uh, almost all human improvements in athletic performance can be attributed in some way or another to advances in technology, uh, whether that be with equipment or training. Um, and that, that's uh, the example I'll use, the 1969 Mets. Uh, video equipment was new and very expensive. They, uh, they invested a great deal of money in, uh, in video equipment and began taping their, their uh, players at batting practice. And just by e being able to watch themselves, they were able to improve their form. And they went on and won the World Series that year. But um, as far as technology goes, uh, let's take, like, for instance, uh, Star Trek, where you have the 3D uh, hologram. There's no reason that in the future you can't be instructed by a similar 3D hologram. Okay. Now then, with what they can do with technology, that hologram can be anybody you want. You've seen that in Star Trek. They create characters. You could have uh, Bruce Lee, Ed Parker, uh, William Chow as your instructor. And I'll even go, I'll go one step further, and I'll say that they'll, they could conceivably create limited energy fields whereby you could actually have contact with and feel that hologram. And anybody who's ever felt Mr. Parker, for that matter, Al Tracy, who was no slouch, I was his favorite ookie, uh, you'll be able to turn the volume down. You'll be able to turn it down. You don't have to feel the full force like we had to back in those days. Now then, um, I'll, I'll take that a step further. Now stick with me here. Um, back in the early 70s, after I got out of the Army, I was, I was coming home from school. I was going to the University of San Francisco, 
stopped to see an army buddy who was working for this little company. It was in some guy's garage in Mountain View. And in the course of talking with, with them, they were building computers. And uh, this one guy in a pair of cutoff jeans and sandals with long hair, uh, I mentioned that, geez, you know, if I could, I, I would have give anything to spend an evening with George Washington and just talk to him, see what his thoughts are and what's going on today and this and that. And his comment was, well, you will be able to in the future. Technology will create that. And I said, okay, all right. You know, movies, you know, you created George Washington, some character plays him. He said, no, we'll be able to take everything he's written, everything he ever said, and we'll be able to put that into a, uh, a technology that then will be able to extrapolate how he would react to a certain uh, question or situation. And I thought, this guy's nuts, man. I'm out of here. The guy's name was Steve Jobs. But uh, now we have a thing called artificial intelligence that, that actually accomplishes that. So in addition to having a hologram that looked like Mr. Parker, you could actually ask him questions. That's been the shortcoming of videos and books. You know, we all hit a wall. You want to ask a question, you'll be able to ask it the artificial intelligence will be able to extrapolate what his answer might be. Okay, this is, this is where technology could go. Will it go there? I don't know. Is there enough money in the martial arts for somebody to develop it? Again, I don't know. Now then, what's the shortcoming of all this technology is uh, it can teach you, it can help you, it can, it, it can try to motivate you. It can't get your butt off the sofa and do the work for you. You still have to get up and train. Without training, all of this is, is just, uh, it, it's, it's nothing. Uh, in my book, people have read it and said, oh, well, it was easy for you. You were a black belt. And I had some situations where I was one, maybe two workouts away from not getting out of there alive. It, it was that razor thin. Uh, I wouldn't want to live on it. So you, you, you've got to do the training. And these are perishable skills. Uh, Joe Lewis once said, you don't train one day, you'll feel it. You don't train two days, uh, your, um, your opponent will see it. You don't train three days, then your students will see it. And if your students see that you're not training, you've lost your credibility as an instructor. So, but what I, what I uh, fear might happen with this technology, and it's already begun, we have people who, uh, with the advent of the private lesson, they ceased going to their group class. They didn't train anymore. They didn't work with the other students. They, they eliminated one of the very important uh, foundational uh, legs of learning, which is extensive interaction with fellow students. They didn't feel the technique. They didn't work the technique. A lot of schools gave up sparring. Well, people get hurt. Well, boo-hoo. You know, it's, it's a martial art. People are going to get bruised. Uh, so they, they gave up sparring. Uh, they don't go to, to group class. They only do the techniques on their instructor. Suddenly you've got a very limited art. Well, then they don't even see their instructor. They have tapes. Maybe you go to a seminar once a year. And what will happen, I'm afraid, and Bob made reference to it, is we will develop, for lack of a better word, a tiered or casted society. Well, these are the guys, they don't, they don't compete. They don't, they don't go to tournaments. They don't test their art. They don't even go to sparring class. They don't go to, they don't go to group class. They don't train. They, they watch videos and they, they do what, what's on the video. The problem with video also is it's all backwards, right? And unless you're Ginger Rogers, somebody asked, is Ginger Rogers as good a dancer as Fred Astaire? And the guy said, well, she does everything he, he does, but she does it backwards and in a high heels. Well, now... Uh, if you're doing it backwards in martial arts because you're learning it off a video, you, you may confuse your opponent for a second, but uh, it's not going to work. So I, I, I see that reliance, too much reliance on technology and not enough on training. Again, the three foundational. You have to have extensive interaction with the material. You have to have extensive interaction with the instructor and you must have extensive interaction with your fellow students. If you don't spar, you don't train, and you don't work with the students, all this technology is for nothing. And in the words of Forrest Gump, that's all I have to say about that. <laughs> well, first of all, anyone who references the 69 Mets is good with me because I grew up thinking Tom Seaver could walk on water. 
And I absolutely agree. I've done a lot of research on artificial intelligence, uh, especially when I did a master's in psychology. And you're absolutely right. It's a compliment, but it's not the only answer. Okay, we have some questions from uh, the audience here, and I'm actually just going to read them off. And the first one, Eddie, if you could come off mute, Eddie Downey, uh, I'll ask you because I think this is a good one for you. And Ted, I'm going to remute you here. So, Eddie, this question is from Tom De Temple, who's a brown belt over at Mr. White School. He said, it's been said that the true test of leadership is how well you function in a crisis. So I'd be interested to hear from the leaders on the panel what they've learned from the challenges of keeping their businesses afloat and their students engaged during the pandemic. And Eddie, I think this is a, a great question for you. Um, we were talking about this as we got on the, uh, on the call today. So let's unmute you, Eddie. Gotcha, okay. Yeah, we got you. So what are your thoughts on that, Eddie? How do you, what have you learned from the challenges of keeping the businesses open and the students engaged during this pandemic? And if you could try to, I know that's a, a long question, but if you could try to keep the answer to one to two minutes and we'll move on to the next set of questions. Well, well I think the pandemic is, has made it very difficult because for people it depends on your circumstance um, if people are in, in community settings it's very difficult because there was a hygiene issue of groups coming in and going out so a lot of people it used to be that the um the community guys if something that was bad happened with the economy or whatever the community guys were the guys who survived because they had low overheads etc but we found that the community guys are being locked out because facilities don't want to let them in and then also some of the people who have commercial units, the overheads are, are getting them, you know. But what I did say earlier, and, and I know a few people heard me, was the fundamentals of our art are strong. We, everybody still loves, loves our art, loves, our, loves, loves what we teach. We've all got strong, we've all got good followings and good students. We will come out the other end. I know some people have taken a lot of pain, and this is something that... Um, you know how bad the hit is if you can suspend i mean we have situations here where uh well our our government have suspended we don't pay all our commercial fees are being suspended and and waived we don't pay any of that we're getting grant aid and income support so there's a lot of good stuff that's, that's happening for us over here so that we know we can come out the other side um and remember you know the our i know all our schools were flourishing we had strong people interest there our camps, everything was going strong. This is like a big pause. And I know there, there have been people, a lot of people got ill, etc. But the vast majority of people who participate in our in our schools and our associations will be there on the other side of this of this pandemic. And the future is good. We we should be positive what we we have a positive future. Um hopefully, you know, mid-year people will start surfacing and we can all get back out and enjoy ourselves on the floor. Thanks, Eddie. Certainly hope that uh, that time when we can get back out on the floor comes rather quickly. All right, next up, uh, Mr. White, if you could come off mute, I'll ask you this one. And this question comes from uh, a guy I've known for a long time, a uh, fine Ken Post here out in Southern California. It's from Erica Kutagawa. So leadership includes vision. Uh, what is the vision of Ken Post leadership? Let me, Mr. White, you're still on mute. There you go. Did you hear the question, right. sir? Yeah, I did. I did. And I think that uh, our vision is improvement. The word do means the way, and it's the way of constantly learning and constantly moving away from pain and toward pleasure. Now, one of the reasons for this, the panel that we have and for this educational opportunity, I, I hope, um, that everybody's experiencing what I'm experiencing and Barbara's experiences or we're learning things. And that's the vision. Mr. Parker wanted us to grow as martial artists. And of course we grow as people. And, um, I think that's the vision is if we didn't try to improve, it would be contrary to what Mr. Parker's vision was. He wanted his art to be in a constant state of flux. Um, and it is, we're in changing, we're improving teaching methods um, are getting better, different methods of communication relating to other sports, biomechanics and athletics uh, and how it applies to martial arts. It's such an unlimited area that adds to the excitement of being involved in it. So uh, I hope that that's our vision is looking back and seeing at things that didn't work 
and how things fell apart and try not to duplicate mistakes and just try to make this uh, canai, that constant and never ending improvement, not only in our schools, but in uh, our lives and our students and um, in our art. That's the fun part of being in this. It's, it's working. Uh, I'm 72 right now, but I'm still getting better. So that's, that's the vision, just improvement. Thank you, sir. Mr. Sepulveda, I'll ask you this next question. So if you could come off mute, sir. And this question came from two different people. Let me, okay, you're off mute. Uh, Mr. Parker did not have a succession plan in place. As leaders of the Kenpo community, especially you with a large organization, do you have a succession plan? And why or why not? I'm certainly not asking you to reveal anything or name names, but <laughs> is that something you've thought about um, as far as your organization? Yes, actually, and it happened just a couple of years back, maybe a few years back, where I got together with a couple of the seniors within the group and just discussed this. And so with our group, uh, I know, and Eddie's included, is that, you know, he's, I'll, I'll reveal him, but uh, he's a great leader and he's going to be part of that, uh, any type of transition as, as a leader because he has the experience. And I believe he may have, you know, his own successors as well, or those that can carry the torch. And so I think it's, I think it was a lesson for all of us when Mr. Parker passed, but I know before he passed, uh, he was at my school in October of 1990 and he spoke of that and wanted to have a big gathering of January of 1991. Well, it didn't happen, but you know, hindsight tells us, you know, so many things, but I, I think it's important for any organization that that's you know out there today to really really think about and have somebody in place to carry that torch and, and to move it forward. Oh, sorry, I was on mute. Thank you for sharing that, and uh, certainly you have some great people in your organization who will definitely carry the flame forward. So last question we have from the audience, and I'm gonna ask it to two people. We'll ask it to Mr. Duffy first, and then Mr. Miller. Uh, so you guys could come off mute when the time comes. But the question is, and it again comes from Eric Akutago, what is the current brand of Kenpo, and how does it derive decisions at the leadership level? So we'll start with Mr. Miller. Michael, I know you've studied some other arts, boxing, and, and some other things, um, which you've mixed into your Kenpo. But in your opinion, what is the current brand of Kenpo, and how does it drive decisions at a leadership level? Okay, well, uh, you know, I feel that, you know, Kempo is an individual art, in my opinion. Um, just like what Mr. Parker talked about tailoring and how we have to tailor the art to ourselves. So I look at Kempo as, you know, you have Ed Parker's Kempo, um, but he was the only one that did that, in my opinion. Um, I do Michael Miller's Kempo, and, and uh, based off of Ed Parker's principles and concepts, and based off of his curriculum, the way that I learned it. Um, and of course, I've learned it from a handful of people. So I, you know, we all learn different versions of the curriculum. You know, it doesn't matter what, you know, which version of five swords you do. Um, the reality is, as long as you have strong basics, and I think basics are everything. Basics and fundamentals are everything. Uh, nothing matters beyond the basics and fundamentals because if you look at uh, forms and sets and 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 uh, self defense techniques, and uh, you look at those, they're all basics put together and you look at sparring and that's using your basics spontaneously um and and learning how to put you know the the, the timing in there and learning how to put uh accuracy and 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 range and and being a uh, understanding how to deal with range and how to deal with accuracy and and proper speed at the proper time and proper power levels and all that stuff but um so ultimately i feel that uh kempo is an individual thing uh, we all create our own style based off of Mr. Parker's system. So you got Mr. Parker's system, but our own styles. And that's what I love about Kempo, quite frankly. I mean, if I, you know, listen, I, I mean, I'm five foot nine. Uh, I, I'm 215 pounds, a little heavier than I want to be at the moment, but five nine, two fifteen. So, you know, you get a guy that's six, six, 200, or uh, you get a guy that's five, four, 150, you know, I mean, we have to tailor this stuff to ourselves. Um, so uh, I think I lost track of what uh, 
<laughs> what the other part of that question was, but um, but that but in my opinion, I I just feel that Kempo is an individual art. Uh, you take any other system or style that you've learned. I was a boxer, I, I, and I was also a wrestler. I I was a good boxer. I was an average wrestler. My thing is, I'm I'm a better striker than I am a grappler. I prefer striking, which is why uh, uh, Kempo is a really good art for me. Um, but, uh, you know, so I took what I learned from those other systems and, and tried to kind of make my Kempo better. Um, and that's basically where I'm at. All right. Thanks, Michael. I appreciate that input. And Mr. Duffy, uh, if you could come off mute, Brian, same question to you. And then we'll, uh, we'll have some closing comments. And the question was, what is the current brand of Kempo and how does it drive decisions at the leadership level? Well, I'm going to mirror a lot of what Michael just said. Um, the current brand of Kempo, you know, Mr. Uh, Mike said something about uh, something that Mr. Parker used to say. Mr. Parker used to say that, that Kempo is not a style. It's a system, a system made up of principles and concepts. How the individual applies those principles and concepts determines his personal style of Kempo. You know, and you could call that your brand. You could call that the brand that you have. Um, when people come to me, you know, what I tell them uh, is that I'm going to teach them what I call the Brian Duffy method of Ed Parker's Kempo Karate, because I'm going to teach them what I have found works best for me based upon his teachings. That's all I can do. And that they're probably going to take what they learn from me and they're going to go ahead and use what they they find useful in that they may have to delve into other things to find things that are more useful for them. You know, we all have our own personal brands of what we do. Uh, I agree again with Michael that it, it comes down to basics, comes down to the, to, to basics and the application of the principles and concepts found within the system. And from that you create your own brand and that there's not going to be any, two individuals that are going to be exactly the same in the way that they do things. You know, so the, the main thing is to understand the system, understand the principles and the concepts, and then find out what works best for you. And you've created your brand. Well said, Mr. Duffy, thank you for sharing that. And that was certainly an easier question than the first one I gave you but less research involved. So before I turn it over to Mr. White to close, I want to thank our panelists and our guests. You've certainly given your time on a, on a Sunday afternoon when I know we all have plenty of things to do. Thanks again to our panelists for continuing to give their time. This is our third state of the art. Uh, special thanks to Dr. Totten for joining us uh, for the first time. Certainly great to have you, sir. Want to remind everyone that on the 15th, obviously the anniversary of Mr. Parker's passing. So Mr. Casey and the Kenpo Karate Hall of Fame will be sharing their interviews and their, their, their tribute to Mr. Parker for, as, as Mr. Sepulveda always says when he closes the seminar, if it wasn't for Mr. Parker, we wouldn't be here. I want to wish everyone a safe and happy holidays. Hopefully we get through this COVID thing. But please stay safe, uh, enjoy yourselves. Try to de-stress during the holidays. And Mr. White, I'm going to take you off mute, or maybe you might have to do it yourself. And uh, you could uh, just give us some closing words. So Mr. White, if you could come off mute. I believe that's it. You are good, sir. If you just want to make some closing right, comments great. and we'll wrap it up. No, I just thank everybody for being here. You know, it's such a great service to Kempo. And like Bashar was saying, I know there's a million things you could be doing on a Sunday afternoon, but you chose to spend your time with us. And I really know that it's going to be something that's going to help people uh, maybe on their own individual journey. And, and that's what we do. That's what our chosen career has been is helping people and sharing Kempo. So I thank you all. I know Barbara, I can speak for Barbara here. We wish everybody just the best Christmas uh, and a great new year, uh, COVID free 2021 as time goes on. But our best to all of you. And I know I'll be talking to some of you uh, as we get closer to Christmas, but Merry Christmas, Happy New Year. Thank you everyone. And I'm going to stop the recording. Appreciate everyone's time. You guys.